Before I begin, I would like to ask us to take a moment of reflection for all of the communities and all of the people that are experiencing pain and hardship right now in Mexico, in Louisiana, in Oklahoma, and in Texas. Um, this, is, this is a once-in-a-lifetime storm, and we don't yet know its impact, but if everything was fine going forward, it would be devastating. And there's so much more to unfold. Um, I want to reassure all of you that the college has been in regular contact with all of our students from the impacted area. Uh, we know what those students' needs are. We're working with them um, in a spirit of sisterhood, brotherhood, and love to help students whose families are coping with this nightmare. Um, we also have a terrific organization. Uh, the Catastrophic Relief Alliance, which is led by Saprina uh, Guarneri and Andy Gelati. Um, that group has been working for more than a decade to help our institution contribute to responses to crisis situations. Uh, the CRA is meeting tomorrow. Um, and each year, our CRA members travel to different parts of the country to contribute to um, repair efforts. Uh, we'll definitely be going to the Southwest uh, to the U.S. in January. We may be able to make two trips if we use spring break well. Um, and I'm very pleased that we have been able to identify already from the college $10,000 of funds to make it possible for even more students to take part in your work, Andy. Please join me in thanking uh, the CRA. Um, philanthropy is, is, can do so much good for us in the development uh, of our mission. Some of you may know that we have embarked upon the first comprehensive fundraising campaign for the institution um, since around roughly 1995 or 96 to 2002 or so. Um, and we've already raised $110 million, 65 million or so of it directly for the academic mission in the form of faculty excellence and student financial aid. Um, and as our campaign ramps up, you're going to start seeing more and more material, videos, campaign events um, to celebrate Franklin Marshall College and to activate our supporters and to remind other people who have been a part of the community in the past that their college values them and hopes they'll help us develop our greatness for tomorrow. Um, so in that spirit, our advancement and communications team made um, a two-minute video that they're putting out to alums and get them ready for the public part of our campaign. I thought I would start this presentation uh, by showing that, and I think it'll put some, some, some big time energy in the room. Uh, so, go right ahead. The numbers are telling. 230 years ago, Four signers of the Declaration of Independence, four future governors of Pennsylvania, two members of the Constitutional Convention, and seven officers of the Revolutionary Army founded one college in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Its graduates, more than 40,000 over two centuries, would go on to lead in industry, medicine, law, government, and countless other fields. Every year adds more discoveries, more achievements, more accomplished alumni to our great history. So, what did our combined efforts add up to this year? We recreated one building, raised a second, and planned for a third. 98% of the class of 2016 was employed or in graduate school six months after graduation. Nine recent graduates earned Fulbrights and six earned other national fellowships and awards. Our 2,217 students put their talents to use in labs, studios, and in the field. 65% did research with a faculty member. 1,100 of them showed the Lancaster community that they know how to serve. And we watched 12 All-Americans and 86 All-Conference Scholar-Athletes on seven nationally ranked teams win four conference championships and advance to six NCAA championships. We celebrated five truly great professors and remembered three more. We discussed more important issues than we can count. The White House honored us. Who made all of this happen? 
Tens of thousands of people love the place, like nearly 300 faculty, 1,200 volunteers, and 10,000 donors. But in the end, the math only matters so much. You cannot quantify this, or this, or this, or this. You can't count character, or drive, or the will to forge ahead. You can't count grit. But we all have these things, and more. We're athletes, performers, leaders, and creators. We're volunteers, philanthropists, investors, and idea generators. And together, we add up to something extraordinary. Together, we are f and I love that line, you can't quantify uh, f and That was Brian Norcross jumping around when, when, when the line came out. It, uh, you, you truly can't quantify Brian Norcross. It's all energy, all the time. Uh, amazing leader of many of our musical programs. Um, and what, what most excites me about uh, f and is not just the numbers. Obviously, it's our mission and it's the people who animate our mission. That's what it's all about. Um, a mission that matters. Real people, um, supported by other real people, making differences in the lives of still other real people. That is what I love the most. And I see three aspects of our mission that then reveal themselves just in beautiful human ways. First, we cultivate the intellectual and personal growth of young adults from all walks of life and the core of what we've been about since we were invented. In human terms, what does that mean? I could talk about Kathy Stepien, who's from Elberton, Pennsylvania, who's been supported two summers of research by Claude Yoder, including the summer after her senior year of high school. I could talk about Elise Thomas from outside of Chicago, who did economic research with a local nonprofit this summer in our PSSI program here in Lancaster. I could talk about Michael Savage, from St. Louis, Missouri, a Melman scholar. Yes, St. Louis, a Melman scholar who um, mentored students first at Washington University in their residential program, and then here at FNM in FNM College Prep. Uh, I could talk about Kevin Cerna from Santa Ala, California, who did some great, in fact, there he is, he did some great environmental research at Professor Bechtel this summer. I could talk about uh, Tekla Yashagashavili from the country of Georgia and graduated last year, an embodiment of the, the passion, the aspiration, and vision of all of our international students. And that one, Tekla, was recognized as the outstanding student in the class and received the Williamson Medal and spoke to the entire class at commencement. But maybe this photo uh, after Tekla shows it all. Um, and this is a shot from last year of 49 people that we just grabbed walking across campus. No makeup, no hairstyles, no bling, just the people of f and I'm tempted to start calling them out. I see Jabari Benjamin on the right. Will somebody please go wake Jabari up and tell him I use his name in this presentation? Um, similarly, uh, uh, oh, there's, 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 there's Hargerman. I think I saw Hargerman. Where is Hargerman? I think, there he is. Sophomore class president, thank you. Welcome back. Spent all summer working for the Secret Service in Kansas City. Pretty cool. Are you watching the crowd right now for any scurrilous behavior? Okay. Um, that is f and We are f and Drawn from every country, community, full American, full global mosaic. A second way to talk about our mission is to talk about how we foster the preservation and enhancement of knowledge and the value of reason, creativity, and discovery. And here, we could go on for a long time. I would love to have more than a minute to talk about Professor Joe Thompson in biology, who took two students, Rashi Anad and Hallie Keatley, to uh, the University of Maine this last summer, where they did some big research on Atlantic long fin squid and how they move and why that's important. I could talk about Kate Plass in chemistry, constantly working with students taught in f and College Prep, taught high school students too, getting them excited about the wonders of chemistry and may figure out some incredible new options um, for alternative energy through her research. I could talk about this big group of faculty. Um, Lee Franklin is the one pictured, but there are many who are developing an initiative proposed by them and our provost, Joel Martin, to dig deep to figure out
figure out what's the new role for the humanity? And what are the enduring roles that we want to make sure we protect? But here's a photo that I think kind of says it all. Um, that's five profs and uh, Ted Lock, a member of our professional staff, who took a field trip to Stanford this summer, rented an Airbnb, um, and sat around together designing a course um, on ideas that they will be implementing or piloting this, uh, this spring, this fall, with 14 students. It's part of our creation, innovation, and design uh, initiative, which we announced last year. Um, and this class will allow students uh, to draw upon resources of biology, of writing, of thought, of film, of physics, and more to identify problems that they want to work on and to identify possible sustainable solutions and to use the opportunity of study and the disciplines, the resources of the disciplines, to think about how to predict, measure impact, assess impact. We may get a chance as a community to hear the presentations of all of these students later in the semester or early in January. Um, Carmen Navia is here, who's a senior. She's been a big part of this initiative. And it's exciting to me to see faculty and students teaming up together to ask the question about how do we continue to do our work at the highest level and do it in ways that respond to the world we live in and the future that we will inherit. There's a third aspect of our mission, and that's that we create and sustain community, um, one in which we can flourish individually and flourish collectively. And here, of course, we can talk about college houses and seminar rooms. We can talk about open mic nights and this weekend summer to summer events. Um, we can talk about what we're doing right now, the Common Hour. There are 7,000 colleges and universities in America. How many do this 25 times a year, every Thursday? 10, maybe? To cite one more example, the Day of Dialogue last year. A huge group of students, faculty, staff, with some alums too, reflected, how could we um, reschedule a full day of classes in order to convene ourselves in this space to start the day and all across campus in every space with the theme being, who are we? How do we get to know one another still better? How do we understand, as a community, what the conditions are for flourishing for each of us? And it was a pretty level playing field with students and faculty together designing seminars or the, the, the workshops led on every aspect of identity. It was so exciting to see the community come together to believe that was what we were called to do at that moment in time. And I'm you know, very excited that Last spring, the faculty held a vote and voted to have another day of dialogue next year. So we'll spend this year, primarily the spring, planning you know, just as great a set of gatherings for us uh, for, uh, for the fall of 18. Um, well, our mission does pretty amazing things for the one and for the many. There aren't many institutions like this in American life, oriented this way. It's interesting, too, that so many institutions um, are old, that so many were created at a time of crisis when America was making itself into a new nation. It had to figure out, what does a democracy do to grow talent, to grow knowledge, and to grow community? And the answer was college. And that's been the answer at other massive turning points in history. Take, for example, the, the aftermath of the Civil War, the creation of historically black colleges and universities in order to respond to the needs of women and men who were closed out from other forms of school. Think about the Marl Land Grant Act, which created many of the great state institutions we know today. Think about the GI Bill, which sent veterans back to college, including here. Think about the changes in the composition of colleges that emerged as a result of the 1960s. Higher education has always been the answer to the American question how we live our democracy and invest in our people, build our society for strength. It's been one of the greatest inventions of our country has been our system of higher education and the values and missions embedded with it across all those different institutions. Now, um, I, 
I, I would say that, for me personally, that is what I have, am called to do. I think many of you say that's what you're called to do, to be a part of that mission. And it, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith. We have to believe that it's worth it. We have to believe that there will be benefits that we won't see today. We have to believe that others will invest their best selves too. It's a leap of faith. We have to, when we take the leap, we believe that we're leaping with others, not alone, that others will support us. And when I say it's a leap of faith, I actually mean that literally. I took a leap this summer with a group of FNM students standing behind me. Now, well, here's the best part. That was FNM men's soccer encouraging me to have confidence when I was plunging 800 feet off the biggest bridge in South Africa and then hanging upside down that they were there for me. <laughs> I think they were. It, but it was pretty cool to be hanging upside down and hearing FNM students going, Yeah, you can do it. Way to go, Dr. P. You can do it. There were people cheering for each one of us every day that we do something that we want to do in order to express ourselves, they are cheering with us. You won't always hear the cheers, but they are there. That's the beauty and power of this institution. Our mission is the right mission for the world beyond FNM, too. It's not just good for us. It's good for the larger society. It's good for the world of today. It's good for the world that's coming into focus tomorrow. I actually put today and tomorrow in my title in a way that's almost contradictory, claiming our future today for the world we will live in tomorrow. Future today or tomorrow? Which is it? It's both in one way. Change. Change will de is defining our future today, and it's going to define the future tomorrow. Exponential change, not incremental change. We have witnessed more change in science and technology, for example, in the last five or ten years than most of us my age ever could have imagined. Ever. What are, the, what are the kinds of accelerating change I want to ask you to reflect upon? Partly because you're going to deal with them, whatever you do in life, partly because we will deal with them. Um, well, one, of course, is the emergence of a science and tech-driven knowledge economy with all the attendant disruption and even destruction of occupations, of particular jobs, and even fields. The obvious metaphor or example is um, Blockbuster. Many of us went there to get our videos, and then videos went away. And then we got DVDs, and then DVDs went away. Now Blockbuster's gone away. Um, and that, that dynamic plays out across the economy every sector. Even if you know what you're going to do 100%, you are positive with your career, the actual work you do will change every five years, forever, because of the way technological change has now um, come to human civilization. A second kind of change is we now live in a creative economy, described so well by Tony Wagner in the book The Innovator where the mindset and skills associated with the creative use of knowledge will bring more empowerment than simply the accumulation of knowledge. We have to be able to use our knowledge. Third, not a new trend, the ever-flattening of the world. Tom Friedman first called it maybe 12 years ago, but it's really flat now. Every country is codependent on the other. Every industry the global industry. Something like a supply chain now sends a t-shirt through five or six countries for labeling, for coloring, for sale. And then there's uh, the, the, the sort of continuation of demographic change in the U.S. and certainly in the world. As our population becomes much more diverse socioeconomically, especially among the young, while at the same time we're also preparing for the biggest wave of retirement in the history of humanity as the baby boomers leave the workforce. Right now, we're projecting about 5 million vacant jobs in 2020 requiring college education as the boomers retire. At the very same time they retire, the demographic of young people that will hold those jobs will have had and will pay for their retirement will have had very different life experiences, very different backgrounds. 
And then one other change. There are just some, I'm calling it the X factor, but there are some just um, long-term factors in our world, such as climate change, threats to privacy, terrorism, broken trust in institutions, and the emergence ever faster of new technologies of war that we have to contend with. They aren't going away. Technology always develops before the ethics. You get the technology, and then you figure out the ethics. I wish it wasn't that way, but that's how it works. So I think a liberal arts education and high quality learning more broadly um, are the answers for maximizing life and promoting the social good in an era of profound change. I think our work is more important today, more important, not less, and especially for the students here, I want to just offer a couple, a couple of the reasons why. You may have even better examples than the ones that I'm going to offer, and you know, share them with me. But first, I think the intellectual habits and skills that we foster, that you students are creating for yourself, in yourself, mentored by the faculty, I think those skills allow us to anticipate, respond to, and create change. I think they allow us to like ride the dragon of change, even direct the dragon of change. I think those that can work with ideas are the most empowered people. Second, I think that the ability to assemble and analyze uh, material, like look at content, allows us to separate good information from lies, what's true from what's fake. It gives us a better way to discern with a torrent of information flowing at us and to make better decisions. Thomas Jefferson said knowledge is power. Um, being able to know what good knowledge is power today. Third, I think our tradition of liberal arts education invites us into language and languages and that by learning languages, we are able to understand the world better, to understand new people, new cultures, new ways of seeing reality, by taking the invitation to learn languages. I think our tradition allows us, in the words of Professor Cornell, who gave that great speech on Tuesday, um, allows us to go deep, to even know what depth is. Many that don't go deep think they're going deep. Going deep teaches you to want to go deep. And at the same time with that, to go wide, too. To connect your deep learning to the deep learning of other people. If you know one thing well, it gives you the ability to sniff out when somebody else doesn't know what they're talking about. It's one of the best reasons to go deep. But we connect what we know deeply with the breadth of a liberal arts curriculum, with the understanding that any problem that interests us has been addressed from multiple perspectives. And our deep learning is both an empowerment and a constraint. I love working on human rights. My field is literature. There's a vast amount of literature, not always considered literature, that addresses the theme of human rights, in which people make claims on others to respect their rights, to deliver their rights. That's what a right's supposed to be, something so strong. It's not that you have it, it's that you're required to help him have it. That's what a right is. It entails a responsibility on somebody else. If it's just a need, it's not a right. Well, literature draws out constant, beautiful, interesting forms of testimony written within conditions of oppression and constraint and captivity sometimes, where people make their cry for others to heed their rights. And I was able to go pretty deep on that in college. But my field has a huge constraint in it. If a right is essentially one that others respond to simply because you describe it in the most compelling ways possible, then those that have the gift of verbal acumen will win the day. The right shouldn't actually be depend dependent upon the person's ability to make the claim. Literature only goes so far. And what about literature that denies human rights? What about literature that tells us that some people don't have rights? Because that exists too. That's why I love this tradition, because as you go deep, you also learn there are biases built into your way of thinking in your field. 
And that by owning those biases, you can reach out to other fields, like in my case, philosophy, law, and international relations, so that I can understand human rights across a breadth of fields. But you have to go deep to want that breadth and to use it well. Our tradition teaches questioning, challenging, interrogation, restlessness. Those are habits of mind that are absolutely critical to human freedom when many types of big brothers are trying to influence how we think. Our tradition empowers learning by doing, in the lab, in the play, in the field, on the field, in the college house, learning by doing, giving us the tools and mindset to be active problem solvers, active culture shapers, active voters, active voices. With all of our interaction, all of our active learning, our tradition allows people of different backgrounds, of all backgrounds, to live together and to live together the dynamic of sameness and difference, where we know ourselves anew because we are both like one another and different. And sometimes we're more like the people we think we're different than. And sometimes we're a lot more different than the people we're like. That's what we learn by being together, engaging authentically in this tradition with one another, in and out of class. Our tradition gets people out of cyberspace and into material space, this physical space, where we can actually get to know each other. You say, that's fantastic. Everybody has that, right? No, not even close. Do you know in the top 50 liberal arts colleges, there are a grand total of 100,000 students? The top, all the top 50? There are 23 million people in college right now. Just 25,000 a year go to schools schools like us. Think about what a rare opportunity that is. I wish more people had it, to tell you the truth. Well, we've heard all the stock arguments about liberal arts is like no good. Um, it's almost always a boogeyman that they're attacking. They're usually because they want attention. They don't like this field, or they, don't, they say they're all working coffee shops. Um, there's, there's a lot of criticism that's just meant to denigrate what we do. We have to counter it. We have to believe in ourselves. We have to take the leap of faith. And you know what? If you don't want to just do it alone, then ask people that work on problems. When you ask people that are trying to solve a big public health problem, or you ask people that are trying to deal with a national crisis like we're seeing in the Southwest, or you ask people how, we're trying to, how they're trying to slow climate change, what it's going to really take, or what it's going to take to really analyze social trauma, they're not going to say that somebody went to a vocational program in order to learn the tactics you need to do to address those problems. They're going to say they want what you're becoming. Thinkers that can see across the terrain and know what you don't know and ask questions. There's a big new book that just came out, reviewed in the New York Times, by a writer named George Anders. It's called You Can Do Anything, The Surprising Power of, quote, Useless Liberal Arts Education. And um, uh, George was on campus researching the book. He actually sat in on Lee Franklin's uh, class, um, and he met with Beth Throne at Ospagad, and he took away a lot of great lessons from his time with us, and he writes about us in the book. Um, but he makes this, here's you know, one quote. For anyone with an eclectic liberal arts background, the invitation to tell your story is an unparalleled chance to shine. This is the moment when the person who's doing the hiring becomes able to see the optimistic search of newcomers with great potential. Precisely because this is a time of great change, what we do has value. And precisely because it's a time of great change, what we do is threat. I wish it was just me saying, this education is going to empower world domination for us. But it's not that simple. These institutions are precious things. They are not birthrights. The very changes that we hope to address with our minds and our work, those very changes could erode the strength from which we do our work of our institutions. I'll just mention a couple. Economic volatility. The flattening of middle class wages over a generation in this country has put higher education at peril. Uncertainties in the global economy ups and downs, an entire nation um, surprising themselves and us with, with economic difficulty puts what we do in peril. 
the growing wave of baby boomer retirees, as I said, really is going to have an impact. Another threat we need to be aware of. Um, too many higher education institutions have responded to the, to, uh, the threat to their, their standing with an ethic of hyper-competitiveness. Where they just invest in winning a game that's about money. They just try to make what people will pay for. Which can be good if people are paying for what they need, but can be bad if people are not getting what they need, but getting what they paid for. I don't have any worry about the value of our institution giving students and all what they need, but there's also no doubt, no doubt, that many institutions are making a different set of calculations. And there's a study that came out just today by the Jack Kent Cook uh, Foundation that is actually infuriating. And it's not about private higher education, it's about public higher education. And the report shows that 23 states now have 40% or higher of their students at their flagship institution coming from outside the state. 11 states have more than 50% coming from outside the state. Those people that are coming from outside the state are being offered a price discount so they will pay more than an in-state resident, but less than they would pay. And the people that are not going to the flagship state institution are those who need financial aid. They have actually completely undermined their own state admissions out of, an, out of a logic of hyper-competitiveness. One reason why they've done it is because something like 44 states, I think, have cut higher ed spending for public higher education since um, 2008, and something like $9 billion overall has been taken out of the public higher ed, higher ed sort of collective budget. But I want to be clear, that actually threatens private higher education. When public higher education, which can get infinitely bigger, stops serving some of its population and takes students from other parts of the country, that reduces the availability of those same students to be recruited for the district. Third threat is disruption of academia itself. Um, I think that what we have here is of enduring and internal value, but it doesn't matter that I think that. What matters is that we are able to constantly be able to provide for students and our stakeholders an experience that delivers what they need. And with technological change, happening so fast, it can be harder and harder for smaller institutions to be able to have the same financial strength from which we built our mission to begin with. One other, there's, there's a fourth challenge that we have to attend to is the erosion of public confidence that our mission makes a difference. We talked about that already. And then there's one more, and I'm going to come back to that one more. Um, and uh, I'll just say this as like a teaser. Uh, students, one of the things, uh, if you're thinking, how do I give a great talk? The thing I recommend you do is talk about something that you don't want to talk about. Because that puts you into uh, a, a space of edginess um, from which there's real authenticity. And when I come back to that fifth point, I think you'll see what I mean. So, how do we move in relation to the opportunity because the world needs it and the threat? because no one's going to take care of us but ourselves. The world needs us, but the world will not protect us. We have to do that. Well, there were three major areas. We have, we, have, we have a strategic plan that we approved in 2012. It's from a document called Claiming Our Future. And we had a set of meetings, and the faculty voted, and the board voted. And the key, the key sentence from that is that we seek to elevate f and as a leading national liberal arts college. That's our, that's our comparative set, leading national liberal arts college in ways that are empowering for students, authentic to college, relevant for tomorrow, and sustainable for generations to come. That is our, that's in one sentence, that's our core strategic objective, and then act on that. And the acting happens in lots of ways. I just I put it into three categories, though. I would say that the first one is to double down on value to never take for granted that we're good enough. Never. To 
constantly be asking ourselves, is this education, as we're constructing it, sustaining it, responding to the needs of the day, the students of the day, and the world you will live in? And students, you are partners in asking that question. We engage it not with defensiveness, but with excitement, that we know we must ride the dragon of change in order to make the greatest contribution. And we've done it so many ways. We've transformed a dorm system into a college house system, which if you think is easy, do a survey of how many schools have done that. We, trans we transformed, a, uh, I would say, a tr very traditional and career center into a much more aspirational office of student and postgraduate development that seeks to have, at, the, at a minimum, a 10-year period of impact on students with a lot of focus on those early years of the 20s, helping you navigate transition and pursue opportunity. We created, the led by the faculty, a new connections curriculum that asks seriously, what are the skills and habits of mind that we want to instill early in students so that you can make the most of college? Do you think that's easy? Do a survey of how many faculty have revised their core curriculum. At most institutions, the core curriculum is a peace treaty. It's, a, it's an agreement that we're going to do this until you know, the White Walkers take over. Um, because it's too hard to change. But this faculty did the opposite and met for two years as a faculty to try to figure out what should the connections curriculum be for you. This is an institution that to improve value, like to double down on value, that's the key point, double down on value, has constantly expanded resources for student research, uh, for internship programs, for summer travel for the Marshall program. Constantly invested in that. And we've constantly invested in um, the gestures that can take the academic program to the next level, prof by prof and class by class. For example, the creation of a faculty center. Uh, the creation of a quant and science center to go with our outstanding writing center. Uh, the significant enhancement of student accessibility services now in a new home, um, uh, much needed. And the recent $800,000 Mellon grant that Provost Martin helped us to secure so that we could strengthen inclusion among our faculty and our pedagogy. Constant commitment to getting to the next level of educational impact enhancing value. That's how we respond to the world. It's how we strengthen our own position in a hyper-competitive time. And the one other thing I'd want to say about that, because it's, again, it's a ch it's change, is that this institution has changed its student body faster, probably, than any private institution in educational history in, in, in the U.S. Because we moved from a class in 2012 that was about 5% students who received federal college and was in the ballpark of 10 or 11 percent domestic students of color to one today, the incoming class of 2021, which has, bracket this, highest average SAT scores in school history, and I'm not a test score fanatic, also has 20 percent who are Pell Grant eligible and has 27 percent domestic students of color. And that is change on a very fast scale. And that's part of the core commitment the institution to enhance value, constantly enhance value. Second strategic priority is at the same time we're doing that to try to manage our resources well and efficiently, uh, to spend where we need to but not overspend, to fundraise extremely well, as I mentioned before, uh, to increase financial aid. The percentage of kids with financial aid has gone from 35% two years ago to 57% today. And our donors are responding. Later today, we're going to announce that um, a man whose dad went here had a start in life because his dad went here. He's given us $4 million in the last four months. He keeps calling with another gift of $1 million. His name is Art Clark in North Carolina. Definitely going to try to bring him up here so you can meet him and say thank you to him. He came one time and met a bunch of students and said, I'm going to take care of you guys. And that's what he's doing. I think he's making money in the stock market, and every time he makes a million, he gives it to us. So, you know, cross your fingers that he's had a good week. The third priority, besides investing in value and managing our resources and fundraising confidently, the third is to make sure we exercise leadership, which we can do, on major national problems. The STEM Posse 
program we created here, led by Dr. Ken Hess, seven years strong now, it's been a national model. The college health system, the Os Ospagati invention, national model. The Aspen Boss collaboration, national model. One that stands out, you saw the picture of Michael Bloomberg, the American talent man. Because of the work we did as a community, all of us, work that's still going on, to build a student body that reflects the nation, Michael Bloomberg said, I'll help you inspire more schools. And so he funded the American Talent Institute. And this is a picture of the president that joined with him. He's the one in the middle with no jacket on, which students, if you're going to take a picture with a lot of people, take your jacket off. A, I watched him do it right before the picture was taken. Take your jacket off. He said, I'm going to fund other schools and you and other schools to help expand opportunity, like the model of F&M talent strategy. We'll call it the American Talent Initiative. And standing with him, because he asked, admittedly, if I had asked, President of Harvard and Yale and Penn and Brown, who are all there, would have said, said uh, um, come back tomorrow. But Michael Bloomberg asked, they said, yeah, OK. And so all those institutions and many more, all top institutions, Amherst is there, Williams is there, Swarthmore is there, Oberlin is there, Wesleyan is there. They're all there because what you've done as a community sets a standard for others, issues a moral call, basically. Do you dare deny opportunity for kids who've earned it when you've seen that a school like Franklin and Marshall can do that? One of the most rigorous schools in the country? Sometimes there's things we do that combine them all, like our visual arts center. The priority of doubling down on value, of using financial resources and fundraising to create opportunity, doing national leadership. This, this is, is a, the design of a project that we think we may be able to start on physically this year. Um, I won't go through it in detail because we'll have opportunities for you to come together and to ask lots of questions about what it is and how it will work. But let me say this. We've raised $16 million towards the 20 we need, which is great. We don't have the final price yet. So until we get that, we can't be sure when we'll start. We've already passed the approval of the Historic Commission here in Lancaster, which is exciting. And in a few weeks, we'll put the bids out for construction companies to tell us how much they need to build it. The building has unbelievable academic value for the institution. And you'll just see a few of the slides. It integrates film, photography, art, and art history. It gives us awesome spaces for faculty artists to show students how they create, and for student artists to be able to work together in space that inspires. There are beautiful classrooms, studio spaces, um, galleries, a huge space where for all aspects of filmmaking and photography, to the state-of-the-art cinema, sound being done by the person in the, the company that did sound for the Kennedy Center. This will strengthen the entire curriculum. The faculty designed it. It will strengthen everything we do. And then on top of that, it's designed by Stephen Hall, who is an, a professor at Columbia and an iconic uh, American architect. Professor Corellis is here. He's written a beautiful short essay about Hall's work. Um, let me just say that this building is going to be a destination for students, uh, already has been studied a, a good deal because of the way that Hall made it. Its shape is a shape never used before. It responds to the, the trees, the oldest living creatures on our campus. and takes a shape that parallels, echoes the trees. Uh, the student studios will be in the trees, looking out. Uh, it's a building that's about sustainability, about how art and sustainability come together. Most of all, it's a statement about liberal arts education pretty confident and bold, saying, we believe that the arts are part of a complete education, and that we're ready to put on the ground and build and bring to life one of the best buildings in the country towards that goal. So if you said, OK, um, I get it. There is change. We have to harness it. We have to defend ourselves against it. We have to strengthen our values. What we, that the intellectual qualities that, you're create, that we're developing will help us in life in big ways. Few are getting this opportunity. But you said there was one more threat. What was that threat? And here, just to say this very plainly, I think that the threat we have is a threat of an administration in Washington, maybe even a broader movement, that is just not affirming of our values, is not even neutral towards our values but is actually publicly and systematically pretty hostile to what we're about. 
I don't say that as a political statement. This isn't about partisan work. I'm actually talking about the mission of the school. What is the mission of the school? Now, I've been working for higher education 20 years, and um, I've worked every single day patriotically, believing that the work we do makes a difference for our country and our students and our people. And I believe every day I've gone to work that whoever was president, Republican or Democrat, that all that person's people believed that we were working, that higher ed was an asset, they were proud of us. I've never once had a moment where I wondered, was the work we're doing somehow not aligned with the aspirations that a Republican or a Democratic president would have for this country? But these times feel different. Just to say it honestly, there are massive proposed cuts being considered right now to financial aid, to student loans, to the AmeriCorps program, and for God's sakes, to work study. Who could be against work study? To say it directly, because you, you do know this, there has been scapegoating of entire groups of people across identity groups. Just play it back in your head, Mexican immigrants, Muslims, prisoners of war, LGBTQ+, members of the DACA community, women as a whole. I'm not making this up. That, is, that has happened constantly. There has been, a, and you've seen it, direct attacks on the media by name, which threaten the idea of the First Amendment. There has been absolutely blatant disregard for the coin of our realm. What's that coin? Facts, reason, evidence-based argument, truth. That's just being attacked. Like, it doesn't matter. It's just a story. Whatever story is loudest. Whatever story is angriest. There have been proposals sitting there right now that totally slash areas of federal research and work that we do here, especially in the climate studies. And there's been an awful lot of civil servants who have literally had a gag order placed on them to not share the research that they're doing. And then finally, there has been a constant, a constant drumbeat of attacks on other nations on the idea of the international system. And I understand these are big, there's big complex questions, and I don't get them all. But I also would hate it if America someday had fewer international students coming here to study. And that's certainly at risk right now. I don't believe that this will directly impact your education today, this week, this month, but I do think there is an accumulated threat that comes from all these different um, ways of not valuing what we're about. So what do we do? And here, this is my last thought, my, is basically that if the attacks are attacks on the core of our mission, we respond by doubling down on the whole mission, by living our mission. Whatever criticism that might bring, whatever doxing might happen to some of us who stand up for what we believe in, that means we must bring in students from all backgrounds and cultivate their talent. We must support knowledge, creativity, discovery, and protect those things. And we must keep convening and friendship, our community, for intellectual discussion like this, to bring together people rationally, to talk through problems, to understand perspectives, to believe that we are one people and not a set of mutually opposed interests that somehow cannot reconcile around big ideas. I thank you for being part of this. If, if that sounds sobering, it's meant with sincerity. I believe the work we're doing today is more important than ever. Thank you.